session is webinar five, Country Food Security and Safety in the Canadian Arctic. It features Dr. Emily Jen Jenkins, Professor and Acting Department Head of Veterinary Microbiology at the University of Saskatchewan. Time has been built in for questions and discussion at the end of the presentation. Please use the chat tool to submit questions electronically at any time during Dr. Jenkins' presentation. And note that while we may not be able to get to all of your questions, we will aim to address them afterwards on the Global Health website. This webinar series has been inaugurated by Dr. Andrea Bauman, Associate Vice President of Global Health and Director of the WHO Collaborating Centre in Primary Care Nursing and Health Human Resources at McMaster University. Andrea, will you please start us off with a few words about launching this webinar series? Thank you, Mary, and thank you everyone online for joining us on this webinar webinar series uh, that we have uh, produced uh, this year. Uh, we organized the speaker series to reflect the transdisciplinary nature of global health, in particular in this case in the Arctic. I want to thank all the speaker series for sharing diverse and expert perspectives on the ever-evolving Arctic issues. As well, our faculty and partners in global health to organize this unique learning opportunity. It's been our privilege to launch this webinar series for you all. Thank you and over to you, Marin. Thanks, Dr. Rowan. Today our guest speaker is Dr. Emily Jenkins, Professor and Acting Head, Department of Department of Veterinary Microbiology, Western College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Saskatchewan, Saskatoon, Canada. Dr. Jenkins brings highly relevant expertise in the area of zoonotic diseases and One Health, research that considers the intersection between people, animals, and the environment. She's the Canadian representative to the Terrestrial Working Group of the International Arctic Science Committee and a member of the Arctic Council's Climate Change and Infectious Disease Working Group regarding international circumpolar surveillance of emerging infectious disease. When not working, you might just catch Emily flying by on her cross-country skis or indoors on a yoga mat in perfect calm away from her energetic university, community, and family activities. Emily, thank you for presenting for the next 30 minutes on country food security and safety in the North. I'll provide you with a one-minute reminder, and then we can move into a discussion with the participants' questions that come up in the chat section. Over to you now, Emily. Thank you so much for the invitation to participate in this series, and thank you to all the participants who are overcoming Zoom fatigue to do yet another online activity. I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm on Treaty 6 and Homeland of the Métis Territory giving my talk today, and that my talk um, focuses quite a bit on Inuit health perspectives, and I acknowledge I am not Inuit, and I have a great deal of privilege um, in, in speaking to this topic. So just a word about country foods. Um, generally, I'm going to use that term to mean harvested wildlife, but it does refer to broader um, foods from the land, so harvesting berries, uh, plants, those are part of country foods, but I am focusing specifically on harvested wildlife because that's my strength as an animal health professional. I'm a veterinarian by training um, who carried on and got very fascinated with public health and logically led to One Health, which is that intersection between human, animal, and the environment. So i um, just going to talk a little bit about Inuit perspectives on country foods, some of the food security issues we face in the Canadian North, uh, a little bit about why I work on wildlife, why wildlife are important, why parasites, that's a question my in-laws asked me at our wedding, like, why parasites? <laughs> when you could have been a nice, you know, fluffy cat and dog veterinarian. Um, I want to give you an example a real life example of a challenge that we've had with risk communication in my field and then what I think and ask you guys what you think the way forward might be. So I'm going to start with a children's book called Umajut. I'm probably saying that wrong. This is 
something that uh, when I went into the wildlife health wildlife office in Cambridge Bay, Victoria Island in the high Arctic, um, along with doing all my permits to export my samples out of the territory in Nunavut, they were also giving out these books and they said, take one for your kids. And so I did, and I absolutely love this book. And it gives me a really unique insight into um, how Inuit Inuit perspectives on, on harvesting wildlife. And so this is a children's book with basically how-to instructions on when you should be harvesting wildlife, what parts of the animal are best, um, what different animals, what purpose different animals serve. And so for me, this really brought home that Inuit respect animals by using them um, and that they know a lot about their wildlife and about the um, the best times of year to access them. And so barren ground caribou are hugely important, um, maybe a little less important from a food security perspective, but wolverines have a purpose for trimming your parka hood because that uh, does not gather frost. And then even the little guys, the lemmings and the bulls, uh, I would love to see my children's faces if I whipped out a lemming skin to whack it on their skin knee as a Band-Aid, <laughs> but by all means use what you have to hand. Um, beluga, again, also important, uh, mainly as uh, harvest for eating, so as muktuk, but also using the fat as fuel for the lamps. And this, um, this was, uh, you know, one of the things in the, in the meeting hall that first meets your eye when you walk in, in Inuvik, in the Western Canadian Arctic. Uh, basically, lunch, <laughs> all the different parts of the beluga. And this is a community freezer in Nunavik in northern Quebec, and this was taken by one of my students. And community freezers are really tremendously important because they're places where people can put food to share if they harvest more than they need. And this just shows you how many caribou are harvested and how important they are to the community um, for various reasons, not just for, for consumption. And Inuit are um, often, I think these are just some images from honestly my Facebook feed where uh, some of uh, the people I've met over the years, I've had the privilege to meet over the years in the North to share some of their thoughts about uh, global perspectives on why, um, you know, a lot of times Inuit come under fire for harvesting wildlife and they're pointing out that, you know, seals are meals and that, uh, that uh, it is a very locally sustainable, um, highly regulated industry, and that uh, a lot of times there's a lot of pushback from the, the international community and from the main, mainstream North American society that really shows an ignorance of, of their complex relationship with the land and the animals in and on it. Uh, this is a quote from Tanya Tagak, who if you haven't heard her sing, get some of her recordings. She's an amazing throat singer. Um, but she is talking about going back to her roots, going back to the land, and that, um, you know, to much to her own surprise, she felt that this uh, consuming raw seal liver was a hugely culturally connected moment for her. Um, and I think that a lot of um, Inuit would agree that having access to these foods and eating these foods is is healthy for them. It, it brings uh, a whole lot of things together culturally, nutritionally, et cetera, spiritually, et cetera. So from Facebook, we go to some graphs because I'm a scientist, so I have to show you some of those. Um, but this is uh, information gathered over uh, several Inuit health surveys. This is um, historically something that across, occurs across the Canadian North and icebreaker goes to mostly the coastal communities to, um, to take various parameters of health, um, all voluntary. And this shows the percent of uh, energy that comes from traditional foods on the left-hand side here. And you can see that, you know, up to 40%, 30% of uh, the diet, the energy from the diet is coming from traditional foods. And on the right-hand side is the percent of the community consuming who eat these foods. And you can see by far that caribou are the most important um, in this on this graph. The other concerning trend that jumps out here is that from 1999, which are these gray bars, to the white bars, which are the 2008 survey, so almost a decade later, 
most of the people, percent of people consuming these foods have gone down. So fewer people are eating traditional foods a decade later. Uh, that's not entirely true um, for all of them, beluga being one, uh, where actually the percent consuming has gone up. But it is an overall uh, concern that, that uh, the amount of people accessing traditional foods is going down. Oh, I keep hitting the wrong arrow, sorry about that. So um, Chris Virgil, who spoke earlier in the series, may well have touched on this, but just a, a very standard definition of food security is that all people at all have times have physical and economic access to the kinds of foods that they need to be healthy, essentially. Um, and there are different aspects of food security. Food has to be available. There has to be enough food. Food has to be accessible. They have to be able to afford it and physically get to it. It should be nutritious and safe, so it should be adequate. And it should be culturally acceptable. And people should have the agency to be able to secure their own food supply. And this kind of means different things. Where you, where you live in the world, this might mean different things. But for Inuit, a lot of it means access to wildlife. And if, because of climate change, the caribou's migratory routes change and the caribou don't come close to town that year, that food is no longer accessible to them. Um, in terms of store-bought foods, there are real challenges in Inuit communities because um, store-bought foods are very expensive. They often have to be flown there, especially the fresh produce the healthier foods. And so there's a lot of uh, food insecurity in the Canadian North. So the flip side of food security is the inability to acquire or consume an adequate uh, quality and quantity of diet or socially acceptable foods. It's also uncertainty. So the cupboards don't actually have to be bare for people to be food insecure. Um, it just has to be that they're not certain they can replace what's in there. Um, so there is a, a, a perspective there that, that is not simply is there food, but is there a reliable known food supply and, and you'll be able to afford it. And we all got a little taste, even in the developed world, of what food insecurity looked like um, early in the pandemic when there was a lot of hoarding and panic buying and these are empty shelves in March 2020 in a, in a big town uh, in Vancouver, BC in Canada. So we all got a little taste of what it's like to not find you know, the cereal that you want in the store. Um, it's a much, much different consideration um, in the Canadian North where it's, it's the norm to not be able to access uh, exactly what you want. And so this, is, um, this was a national study looking across three of the major Inuit uh, lands in Canada, Nunavut, the Inuvialuit settlement region, and the Nunatsiwut region, showing the levels of food security. So on the right-hand side, you can see this blue bar is about 92% for Canada in general, and that's food secure, i.e. have enough food, have enough access to suitable food. And as you go over to the left, you can see that that green bar gets smaller and smaller, and the orange bar and the gray bar get bigger and bigger to the point where 70% of households in Nunavut are facing food insecurity on a regular basis. That means not being able to feed your kids in um, 70% of households. So that's, that's pretty shocking for a developed nation. And some of that, like I said, is that it's hard to get the food there. So this is uh, Churchill, Manitoba, which actually did at the time use a, a train to get food up there. That's not even possible for most of the high Arctic. There are no roads. There are no railways. It is all coming up uh, by air or possibly in the summer you can ship some things by barge up, uh, for example, the Mackenzie River. But uh, sometimes the food just can't get there because of weather, because of transportation concerns. And when it does get there, it's very expensive. And so you can see here on the right-hand side, this little inset, this is a four liter jug of milk, which is $20. If I went to buy that here in a store in Saskatoon, even at the height of the pandemic, it would be $3. So that is an astronomical markup um, because of the cost of getting especially fresh foods up north. So the Nunavut Food Security Coalition, um, is looking at some of these challenges. They've identified some things that make Nunavut more food insecure than other places, including large family sizes, the high cost um, of transportation, 
uh, low income, poverty, and food insecurity, unfortunately, go hand in hand. The fact that store bought foods are unhealthy and expensive. And this is really, this is really unique. Changing access to hunting grounds, changing wildlife stock, and concerns over the health of their wildlife are uh, explicitly addressed as concerns facing food security. Um, so this brought home for me that wildlife conservation and wildlife health are food security and human health in the Arctic. There is no line between them. This is truly one health. Um, they are so intertwined and interconnected, you can't have one without the other. So what do, where do I come in? What do I study? Um, I study a variety of different wildlife across the Canadian Arctic. Um, I compare marine versus terrestrial systems. I compare migratory wildlife, which have very different uh, exposures to different pathogens and parasites than the resident wildlife have. And then I also look at country foods as both a source of potential human exposure to pathogens, but I also look at some other animals that are more sentinel. So for example, wolverine and fox, are carnivores, they're trapped for fur, but they're not commonly consumed. So they aren't really a source of human exposure, but they are high level predators. So they're way up the food chain. And so they bioamplify post pathogens and of course also contaminants, chemical contaminants. So they're um, often more sensitive indicators of the levels of transmission of pathogens in these systems. They're also a little less politically loaded in the sense that I'm not testing I, I'm not, I don't work for our food inspection agency, so I'm not doing food safety testing per se. So there is an advantage to looking at these non-consumed species as well, scientifically, and um, sen being sensitive as well. Where I work is, um, is honestly across the Canadian North, and we have a large network that I am part of that does a lot of the, the sampling, and we work very closely um, in many of these regions with territorial wildlife biologists, with, uh, with hunter and trapper organizations, with veterinarians um, across the Canadian North, from the Inuvialuit, Nunavut, Nunavik in Northern Quebec, and then that favorite out on the, uh, the coast of Labrador here. All right, so um, these are some of the sentinel species I mentioned, wolverine, as well as Arctic fox in their summer and their winter, uh, forms, and you can see here this one arctic fox in its summer summer um, fur coat is sitting in front of a lot of snow geese. One of the places where I do, um, I've been working for over a decade now, is a place in, in central Nunavut which has the largest uh, breeding ground of um, migratory geese in the Canadian Arctic, if not the world, and millions and millions of geese nest there every year. Also featured in a recent uh, David Attenborough series, if you are so inclined. So why parasites? Why do I work on parasites? Um, there are two foodborne parasites that I work on. One is a protozoan or single-celled creature called Toxoplasma gondii. And it has a very complex transmission. It can be transmitted by food, water, directly from the environment. Uh, the ultimate source of this parasite are cats. So domestic cats and wild cats are the only known hosts that, that um, allow the parasite to reproduce sexually in their intestine. And so they're the ultimate source, but almost any vertebrate, any uh, warm-blooded creature, mammal, or bird can serve as an intermediate host, having these little tissue cysts in their muscles or in other parts, other organs. And so each of these is a muscle cell, and you can see this little purple blob, that that we've managed to stain with a special stain here. That is the, um, that is the tissue cyst form of the parasite, very, very microscopic. Another one that I work on is a roundworm or nematode called trichinella, and there's multiple species that are important in the Arctic. This one is transmitted only through foodborne roots, so from meat eater to meat eater. And this is the little uh, encircled larvae sitting in a cyst in the muscle tissue that would be consumed by another meat eater that would then develop briefly in the intestine to the adult parasites who then produce these larvae which shower out into the body, into the muscles. And um, they're not particularly pathogenic in and of themselves, although if you, if you get a major dose of them, they can cause um, 
if it ends up in your heart tissue, can be a bit more of a problem. Toxoplasma, likewise, many people are walking around exposed to toxoplasma and would never know it, uh, but it can cause um, issues, particularly uh, for fetuses and mothers infected for the first time during pregnancy. So trichinella exposure in the north, um, again, this is coming from that um, Inuit Health Survey data where they actually take samples from people and, and test them for antibodies to various pathogens, one of them being trichinella. And you can see that there's a pretty low overall seroprevalence in most of the regions, except in Nunavut, where there does seem to be a fairly high seroprevalence, indicating people are exposed. And what we more commonly see in trichinella is that um, we see outbreaks associated with food, and because of food sharing networks, some of these outbreaks can be uh, very big, many households affected, even multiple communities. Uh, one harvested walrus, bits of it may go to many, many different places. So we do see outbreaks most commonly associated with consumption of walrus or bear, and there was some question in Nunavik uh, a while back uh, as to whether or not seal were a source of exposure. So a lot of my work in the north um, has been actually ruling things out. <laughs> so I've been testing beluga and testing seal for trichinella and haven't found uh, that of the small sample size we've looked at so far that they seem to be infected with trichinella. So it seems like they're a lower risk, but we do know for sure that walrus and bear are associated with human transmission. And one of our most recent studies, which is just coming out, actually looked at a really long-term data set over the last 50 years of uh, blood samples from polar bears harvested in the Western Canadian Arctic. And we found that exposure to trichinella and toxoplasma has increased over these decades, and that there are strong links to climate as well, that warmer, warmer temperatures led to more trichinella transmission, and wetter summers led to more toxoplasma transmission. So we know that uh, environment is a big driver of parasite transmission, and that these numbers seem to be going up is a bit concerning. And just a reminder that the Canadian Arctic is experiencing global warming at a rate three times the rest of the globe, uh, double that which uh, the rest of Canada is facing. So these are overall warming trends that are actually observed in the last 60 years or so. And you can see here in the Canadian Western Arctic, 2.7, 2.8, 2.2. So some of the highest rates of warming, a real canary in the coal mine. So toxoplasma also seems to have a higher level of transmission in people in the north than other than in other regions of North America, where the, the average in North America is probably around 10 to 15 percent of the population would be seropositive for toxoplasma if I just randomly took a sample. Um, globally, we say about a third of the global population has probably been exposed to toxoplasma. Um, if you look at Nunavut and Nunavik, particularly Nunavik, the um, percent of seropositive was as high as 88% in some of the communities in Nunavik and overall was 60%. Now that data is getting a little older, it's about a decade now, so we don't know what the trends are, but it certainly does seem that toxoplasma has higher levels of human exposure in the north. So this is a phrase from, uh, from an editor of a journal saying that toxo is a very important infection in the North American Arctic. I have a little beef with the phrasing neglected infections of poverty because being exposed to a parasite does not mean you are poor. Um, in fact, being able to hunt country foods uh, takes a lot, <laughs> it takes money and uh, education and training. And so it's a bit insulting to call these neglected infections of poverty. Um, however, there are certainly socioeconomic disparities at play. So this brings me to an example, a concrete example, of one of the issues in, of risk communication when you're doing, um, when you're testing wildlife for pathogens that can transmit to people. So this was actually from work that happened before my time. This uh, was in 2014. A lot of headlines came out because toxoplasma had been found in belugas in the Western Arctic. Uh, there was a bit of a media frenzy over this. There was a lot of um, accusations that this was climate change, that this parasite had newly made it up north because of melting ice and breakdown of ecological barriers. Um, climate change was, was fingered as the cause of this. Um, and that raised a lot of questions in the communities. Um, just to give you a little perspective, and I, Chris may have, Fergal may have touched on this, but there's this long legacy of finding shocking things in Arctic wildlife and then communicating it in a way that makes people afraid to eat their wildlife um, and even to nurse their babies. Uh, so 
there is there is this long history over the last 50, 60 years of finding high levels of contaminants, heavy metals, PCBs, organic pollutants in Arctic wildlife um, because of a, what we call a grasshopper effect and inappropriately expressing the risks to, to community members and, and creating a lot of fear. So against that background, we had the community in this region saying, can we eat our beluga? Like, is it safe to be eating our beluga if they're full of this toxoplasma parasite? And this may not look too appetizing to us, but honestly, this is a huge delicacy um, and also a, a very important staple item when a beluga is harvested in these communities. Uh, on a poster at a conference, I saw beluga is our potato. It's as important as a potato is to the, to the rest of, to other cultures. So we did some preliminary testing on belugas in this population, and we found very scant evidence of exposure in blood and very scant evidence of DNA of the parasite in the tissues of these beluga. So we concluded that, although from other work we know that geese may be a source, um, that beluga were probably very low risk for exposure of people, um, simply because although the parasite may be present, it seems to be present in very low amounts. And the other thing that, that made us feel fairly confident in saying that it was a low risk to people was that as part of that Inuit Health Survey um, back in, in 2010, or sorry, in 2008, they found that there was very low levels of zero exposure in people in that region, um, and generally in people who are older than 40 years of age, so generally not of childbearing age, which is the highest risk group for toxoplasma. So that kind of supports that beluga is are probably not a major source of exposure of people in this population. But I, uh, I had to go up. Uh, I was on maternity leave. My child was about four months old. And because of the history of inappropriate risk communication about toxoplasma and beluga, uh, there was a couple concerns the community had. One was that this toxoplasma was found in beluga that were harvested by hunters and had been eaten long before they were told that there was a parasite in them. Um, they found out from the media, from the radio, rather than from the researchers. So they'd had a pretty bad experience. And um, when I started working with this community, I found it, I, I really swore to myself that I was not going to make those mistakes, that I was going to report results face to face, even if that meant going up on my maternity leave <laughs> to present the, our findings and to contextualize them appropriately to the community. Um, and there was quite a bit of, of uh, coordination with public health to release, release things like this fact sheet, which co concludes with country foods are safe to eat. And in general, that is true, absolutely. Um, we, do wanted, we did want to make uh, the distinction that pregnant women are in a different risk group and immunocompromised people are in a different risk group. And so for them, perhaps, uh, you may have to make some shifts in, in dietary preferences. Going back to food safety, what, do, what does it mean when we say food is safe to eat? That means safe when consumed as, a t as intended. So here's some chicken strips that uh, are uncooked. They need to be cooked, but you can't really tell by looking at the breaded outside of a chicken strip whether it's cooked or not. So people sometimes, for whatever reason, don't cook these properly or don't know that they need to cook them. And sure enough, we see outbreaks due to salmonella. Um, so this would have been perfectly safe if cooked completely fully as intended. And the other thing to think about is by the target populations. And there are different rules for different risk groups. So pregnant women may not want to eat a lot of beluga, not only because of toxoplasma, but also because of heavy metals like mercury and other things that may be more of a concern for the developing fetus. So in the end, um, we know that things like having hunters in the house, having support programs for hunters, uh, food sharing initiatives. One, one really warming thing I heard during the pandemic was that uh, food sharing has actually gone up since the pandemic started in the North, that people are looking out for each other and making sure everybody has enough food to eat. And the other thing that can really help alleviate food insecurity is on-site food safety testing. And so Nunavik and Nunavut all have started test or have established testing programs for trichinella in walrus. But um, We'd like to help them expand to test for toxoplasma as well, and we're working with Nunavik on that right now. So uh, this, this is an open call. This 
this is the call right now for pitches to improve access to food in the north. And if you have thoughts, please send them in. We really need, look forward to getting that. So to end, I just want to say that um, through over 20 years now working in the Arctic, um, I can say that parasites and pathogens are natural parts of ecosystems. They should be there. Um, that we do need to encourage traditional food consumption, but we should consider special messages for high-risk populations. That there is uh, undoubtedly traditional knowledge that is protective against transmission of parasites and other concerns from wildlife, and that we should be seeking out um, and sharing that and helping helping Inuit share their traditional knowledge about, you know, which wildlife should they not be harvesting, what times of year should they harvest, what organs should they not eat. It's it's all there. Um, and it's been working for hundreds of years, and we should be tapping into it. Um, promoting local capacity for food sharing to address food security issues, as well as food safety testing um, can be a solution that can help people make the decision of whether or not they're going to eat the walrus they've harvested, and if so, how they're going to eat it, because a lot of traditional methods of food preparation don't involve cooking. <laughs> and that we do need to get ready for climate change, because what we know about transmission in these systems is based on the past and things are changing and they're changing faster than ever before. We are facing an unprecedented rate of warming and uh, changes in precipitation patterns. There aren't many climate change deniers living up north because they're seeing the evidence with their own eyes every day. To end, I just want to emphasize the UN. There are 17 sustainability goals established by the UN, and wildlife in the North contribute to at least 11 of these goals, including alleviating poverty, alleviating hunger, promoting health, um, education. A lot of, um, I'm working with a high school in Cambridge Bay who are out trapping Arctic foxes as part of their high school science project, which is awesome. Um, Wildlife industry is a really important part of finding jobs and economic growth in these regions. Um, it is very sustainable. It is locally grown food. Um, so it ties into 11 and 12. Protecting the planet, life below above water and above water, of course, have relevance for wildlife. And then peace and justice, because access to wildlife and harvesting wildlife uh, should be an inalienable right of First Nations and Inuit in our country and to do so safe, as safely and uh, based on the best possible evidence as, as we can. So for my work, there's been huge, huge contributions from communities and hunter-trappers across the Canadian North, many graduate and veterinary students, territorial biologists, wildlife officers and veterinarians, several federal agencies, um, and then funding has come from a variety of sources, including ArcticNet and CERC, um, the Fisheries Joint Management Committee in the Inuit, Inuit Alouette region, and a local college fund as well. So I'd be very happy. I don't know if I got a one-minute warning or not, but I think we're there. So uh, yeah, I'd be very happy to speak to any questions people might have. Dr. Jenkins, uh, first of all, that was brilliant timing right on the minute there. And so I didn't bother with the warning, but thank you uh, for your insightful presentation. Uh, you just covered so much ground um, in your presentation. I'm sure there's uh, uh, tons of questions coming in. So uh, participants, please be sure to use the chat section to uh, send us in more questions. Um, first one, you mentioned about the uh, um, ill-informed protesters around uh, the seal hunt and so on. Um, Based on that, as well as the additional information that you've presented about parasites and risk, should we advise the Inuit to stop eating raw meat? Yeah, that's a really good question. And, and indeed, sort of it's the public health reflex, right? Anytime that there's a foodborne hazard in foods of animal origin, it's just cook, just cook it, right? I mean, it's up, you see it everywhere. Cook to an internal temperature of 70 degrees Celsius on, on every retail meat that you get in the store. So it is reasonable to say that that would be a control measure for most of the parasites that I work on. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of cultural insensitivity in that recommendation. Um, Inuit have been preparing foods in their preferred ways for many years. Some of it is raw, some of it's fermented, some of it's smoked. Um, and so, you know, again, it comes down to different risks. 
and that what generally might be okay for the, the general population might not be as safe for immunocompromised or pregnant people. Uh, what I think is great is this, this trichinella initiative in Nunavik and Nunavut. So people do like to consume their walrus in a way that would not inactivate the parasite. What's kind of cool as a parasitologist is that the trichinella in the north is not killed by freezing, whereas the trichinella in the south that we're more commonly used to associated with pigs is killed by freezing. So even freezing your meat up north won't kill trichinella because it's so Arctic adapted. Um, so there are really the only way to kill trichinella in the north is to cook it, but you could also test the carcass. And so many of our, um, the several communities in the north have, have decided to initiate their own food safety testing program to say, yeah, this walrus is negative. You can eat it in your traditional way. Um, and that's just so much better than saying generically a basic guideline, oh, just cook everything. So I guess it depends. <laughs> it depends on the risk group and it depends on the access to food safety testing. Did I lose people? Sorry, I was I was talking to myself there. I guess. Can you explain a little bit about why in the south trichinella is, is uh, killed in freezing, but not in the north? Can you explain that a little bit further? Yeah. So it's, there are different species. So the traditional ones that we know about that when most people when they hear trichinella or trichinosis, they think of pigs. And indeed, there is a very um, there's a species of trichinella, trichinella spiralis, which is very classically associated with swine. In Canada, we've largely eradicated that parasite because of the way we raise our pigs and the strict regulations and testing around pigs. So if you go and order pork from a supermarket in Canada and um, you were inclined to eat it raw, you would probably not get trichinella mm -hmm. <laughs> because we've eradicated it from pigs. You probably get, you might get salmonella or other things, so I wouldn't advise it. Um, and the other thing you could do is freeze it to kill the, the parasite. Um, the, the issue with the northern adapted strains is that they're smart. They figured out that in a, in a country where a carcass is going to be frozen within a day in the Canadian winter in the Arctic, that they'd better be free tolerant. And so, um, I guess I'm anthropomorphizing here, but evolutionarily speaking, it became a real advantage to those northern adapted parasites to be able to survive freezing for literally years. I can go to my freezer and pull out a piece of wolverine meat from a decade ago, and there will still be a few live larvae wiggling in there. So it's, they're quite tough and quite adapted to their, to their environment. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, um, you mentioned the food sharing networks or the community freezer, um, and certainly when we listen to that as people from the south. We think about, yeah, we have similar things happening here to help uh, people who are experiencing food and uh, security issues. Is, is, that, is that a sustainable model for addressing food insecurity? How does it work? Um, it's, it's certainly a start. Um, it's not going to give a completely balanced diet. Uh, I know there's a lot of interest in looking at greenhouses as well in, in the north to try and increase the lo ability to locally grow produce. But um, how it works, um, it works because I think of the, the history, the tradition and the generosity of northerners to look out for each other. And although it's not the main focus of my work, there are some other researchers um, at my university and elsewhere who've really been studying these food sharing networks. And they are tremendous to see how wide those networks are geographically. Um, and they are really key during times like this when uh, there are food shortages in general, but in the North there always are food shortages. So I think these could be encouraged. Um, quite often you can take, um, you can hunt a large animal like a whale or a moose, and there is an, there's way more meat there than you can use. And um, so it absolutely makes sense to facilitate ways to share that to people who can use it 
um, or at least to, to find ways to freeze it back against times where you don't have as much food. And I, I think there's just such a long history of doing that in the North that it's completely logical it, that, that maybe something we in the South aren't, uh, aren't as good at and haven't, um, you know, other than food banks and things, haven't really thought much about we could learn from them. Okay, thank you for that. Um, you mentioned that uh, the milk is is twenty dollars, and you know that's always eye popping, of course, when you when you see that type of thing. What role, if any, should the uh, federal and territorial governments play in ensuring food security in the north? Um, that's a political question for for uh, someone uh, who probably thinks about that a little bit, but. Um, how do we make sure that, that that's effective? So is it a bottom-up or a top-down? Or uh, what would be your perspective on that? I'm assuming you're not a politician, but uh, you might be. <laughs> Absolutely not. So I'm an animal health professional who dabbles in public health and one health. Um, so I would say, from my uh, probably uneducated opinion, that it's got to be a mixture of top-down, bottom-up and that that's the only way, honestly, to meet usefully in the middle. Um, I think that there would be great, I mean, great grassroots, um, and there is actually growing grassroots trends that you can see on social media of Northerners and Inuit saying, we've got to address this problem. This is, you know, we need a healthier diet. We need to be able to afford the foods that uh, we all take for granted in the rest of Canada. So that's the bottom up, and it's it's well underway. Um, there has been some top down initiatives. There's been uh, the food mail program that is now replaced by a more recent program that is supposed to subsidize the cost of shipping food north. Um, so somewhere in between, it, which obviously hasn't been 100% successful, if we're still looking at 70% food insecurity. Um, the other thing is to address the larger socioeconomic picture because food security is intrinsically linked to poverty and so addressing those issues isn't an easy fix but it's going to be one that that takes um all hands on deck to try and address it okay thank you for that uh, you, you mentioned earlier in your presentation about uh, some of the communication of the studies that come out and uh, it sounds like the, the results of that are almost alarmist if you will um, the, uh, one, one thing that's come up recently is that the, we're seeing many cases of mineral mining in the Arctic that's causing concerns over wildlife, like the iron mine expansion that, uh, and leaks that were in the news recently. What kind of impacts can expanded mining have in terms of animal health and even uh, pathogen spread? So those are really good questions. Um, certainly we need a really robust environmental review process. To, to include wildlife and the effects on wildlife, not just um, not just the physical changes in the land, but also the, the changes in wildlife. So there is um, interest and focus on doing monitoring in wildlife in these regions. Um, it's very touchy <laughs> in the sense that these things also create jobs for Northerners and are important parts of alleviating some of those things that we just identified as problems. So, um, it needs to be done carefully. It needs to be done with monitoring. And we also, you know, this is something that came up at a recent meeting um, in, in the um, Conservation of Arctic Fauna, Flora and Fauna meeting, was that mining is actually um, a way to get some enhanced wildlife monitoring out there, that having an increased presence of, of people and development in the north gives us a unique chance to access and sample and observe wildlife that we wouldn't otherwise have. And we should at the very least be capitalizing on the opportunities that go along with it, um, as well as doing our best to alleviating the, um, the, the challenges to health. So it's, it's again, one of those gray areas that doesn't have, um, doesn't have an easy solution. Um, certainly they, any new developments are going to have to go through quite a bit of consultation to become approved, and they should definitely be considering impacts on wildlife. Um, you know, I know the other day we got uh, informed about uh, an Arctic fox that had been hit by a car in the north of Ter in Nunavut, which, you know, we just thought something we hear about every day. And uh, so that was an impact of mining. 
And you could look at that as, oh, that's the negative impact on wildlife. On the other hand, that gave us a data point that we wouldn't have otherwise had. So it's a mixed bag. Okay, thank you for that. Um, this will take you back to your own area of expertise, Emily. Thank you for this question, whoever submitted it. Any theories on why the parasites you spoke about have affected bears and walruses more than the beluga and other water animals? Yeah, so that is a good question. Um, chickenella in particular is only transmitted to carnivory. So the more carnivorous an animal, the more likely it is it's going to have trichinella. Um, and so that's one aspect is the diet and where, where these animals are in the food chain. Toxoplasma is a little different because it has all these different ways of getting around um, and getting into animals. So we do actually see some level of exposure in marine systems, which could be due to runoff from the land, washing the, the oasis from cat feces into, into the oceans, where they can then be filtered out by filter feeders and consumed by, by marine mammals. So that's one potential explanation for how this really very terrestrial parasite is ending up in marine wildlife. Um, so it, it requires a, a deeper ecological understanding. Um, why walrus are so, so highly, um, why the prevalence of trichinella is so high in walrus remains to this day a bit of a, question in the scientific world um, because we assumed that they generally eat a lot of fish which aren't supposed to be good hosts for trichinella so they must scavenge they must scavenge on carcasses of terrestrial mammals on carcasses of other marine mammals uh, but what goes on in the, the depths of the ocean is still a still some mysteries there so great grad project if anybody wants to take that on Some questions about risk communication. Am I unmuted now? Yes. Okay. It seems to be something wrong with my mouse here. Um, you mentioned that um, you uh, dabble in public health, which I think is a bit of an understatement of what you're up to there, Emily. And I'm wondering if you could talk to our audience about how you made the uh, uh, jump or leap, whatever, from veterinary medicine to include uh, public health a little bit for anybody that's uh, wondering about changing uh, areas that they're studying as well. Yeah, so honestly, a large portion of veterinary medicine is actually public health. Um, the things that we do to ensure a safe food animal supply is very much for the benefit of public health, uh, making sure our domestic pets are vaccinated for rabies and dewormed for parasites that we can get is another public health action. So honestly, veterinarians do just by their day-to-day -day life practice public health. For me personally, um, I actually got drawn into it when I worked briefly after my PhD for the federal government as their wildlife disease specialist. And I came in in 2005, basically through to work on wild birds through Environment Canada. <clears throat> and at that time, 2005, H5N1 avian influenza was starting to take the world by storm. And the first question I got asked literally like the second day I was on the job was, could wild birds bring this Asian strain of H5N1 to Canada? And I went, uh, I'm a parasitologist, so I will get back to you. And I had a crash course in virology and I did a crash course in migratory bird patterns and their movements. Um, and really, that and West Nile virus dominated uh, my first uh, year on the job, at least. And that really drew me into working with public health to address wildlife reservoir diseases. And um, I'm afraid that the importance of those has only gone up in our recognition of SARS-1 and SARS-CoV-2 as emerging from wildlife. So we, those lines between wildlife and conservation, wildlife health, and human health, they're thinner all the time. 
So I would encourage anyone to to uh, keep your mind broad in terms of figuring out what your mandate is um, in in any profession, because One Health and Global Health are hugely interdisciplinary. They need people who are going to look beyond the silos to break down those walls. Um, and it's it's sometimes a bit scary to be operating outside your comfort zone or your mandate, but it is incredibly rewarding and we need all these different perspectives to to fix these incredibly complex problems like emerging wildlife diseases that affect public health. Thanks for that. You're, you're starting to sound like Andrea Bauman, actually. <laughs> dangerous, dangerous. Uh -oh. uh, you had mentioned uh, that uh, domestic cats carry taxoplasma, and I guess this sort of builds on your previous question. And I know that the uh, number of domestic pets have gone up with the uh, recent uh, challenges that we've been having, and certainly students uh, love uh, having cats around. Do you have any advice about uh, if, if taxoplasma is the ultimate source, uh, or sorry, if de domestic cats are the ultimate source of taxoplasma, any advice to people with cats? Well, I have one myself. Um, <laughs> so I'm, a, I'm a, a good poster person for this. I There is very minimal risk to healthy cats that are um, indoor cats only, fed a commercial diet, all those things decrease the likelihood that your cat is going to be exposed to toxoplasma, period. The other is litter box hygiene. So changing your litter box every day prevents the parasite from developing from the uh, shed stage to the stage infected for people. So even just like daily litter box cleaning, that's, uh, that reduces the risk tremendously. We all have standard uh, recommendations that pregnant women should not change the litter box. And for me, I had three kids, so that was like three years off the litter box hot tip there. Um, the other is that there are other sources of toxoplasma that, that are probably less well in, or less well publicized. And so eating meat, unpasteurized milk, unpasteurized dairy products, all those things can contain live toxoplasma. So the, there is still a, an ongoing discussion over how much of human toxoplasmosis is from foodborne roots versus directly from cats or rarely from waterborne as well. So um, cats get a lot of grief over this one. It's often called the kitty litter parasite, but really um, there are multiple ways people can be exposed. Okay, great. Don't be afraid of, don't be afraid of your kitty. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to know. Let's take you back to, uh, to Arctic uh, questions here with a couple of come in about communication. Um, uh, that, that the inappropriate communication or uh, communication that can be misunderstood as a result of, of, of the communication around the study results that, that you had mentioned, um, you, you went up personally to deliver those results. So that's one way to uh, ensure that the communication is uh, accurate and clear. Are, are there other uh, ways that you would suggest in terms of communicating results of studies that, that you think are important in the North or have have uh, the Inuit indicated to you what their preference is about hearing the results of studies? Uh, um, can you uh, embellish a little bit about what, what might be more appropriate than what's been done in the past that seems to have gone awry? Yeah, another, another tough question I don't have an easy answer for. Um, as a Southern researcher, it is very presumptuous of me <laughs> to say the best way that, that uh, people want to hear about your results. I do know they don't appreciate hearing about it from the media before they hear about it through pro like official channels. So that's one thing. Um, the other is, is that it really should, almost all Arctic research is increasingly being brokered by the communities themselves. So if there's a question they want answered, uh, working with them to answer that question means you've already got uh, people, stakeholders invested in the answer who are going to help share the uh, the results of those studies um, with the people to whom it matters most. So uh, I would say the more we work with Indigenous governments, with um, communities themselves to address their research questions and building their capacity to do their own research, 
that's going to take care of a lot of these issues because um, it won't be me flying in, uh, giving a giving a uh, a talk to the community, which may or may not be well attended. I've had some situations where they haven't even come to unlock the hall <laughs> for you to give your talk. Um, so we have to do it better. Um, we also have to give our audience credit for being able to understand nuanced risk communication that um, Inuit are perfectly, and the general population is increasingly able to understand that there is gray in scientific results, there's gray in our understanding of health, and that we need to be able to transmit nuances. And that's on us, the scientists. We have to do a better job of saying this is the areas of uncertainty and this is what we know, this is what we don't know. Here's the evidence. You make your decision as an informed uh, member of the community. Okay, thank you for that. We just have time for one uh, last quick question. Should we test uh, wildlife harvested for human consumption the, the same way we test livestock and meat in, in grocery stores here in the South? Yeah, that's uh, that's a tough question too because um, you know knee-jerk reaction of many hunters, indigenous or not, is uh, it's my my decision to hunt, my decision to eat what I hunt, um, and I don't need this to become part of. I mean, the reason I do this is I don't I want to eat wild meat and I don't want to um, buy into the whole uh, domestic livestock production and system. So. There are some that would say, no, it's buyer beware. <laughs> in this case, hunter beware. Uh, you, you, you take the risks inherent in eating what you catch. Um, I would like it to be that there was at least the option to have wildlife harvested for food consumption tested as in, in as much as logistics allow. Um, so that those who want to have it tested can have it tested. Those who don't, then by all means, continue harvesting as you have traditionally done. Um, I do think that uh, Canada's lucky in that our retail meat is amongst the safest in the world and that we can learn some lessons from that, that they're, they've obviously done a lot of things right. Thanks so much for that. And thanks everyone for those compelling questions. Uh, uh, very well thought out. And Let's quickly wrap up the webinar. I want to thank everyone for attending and a special thank you to Dr. Emily Jenkins for an excellent presentation and uh, handling some pretty tough questions there today. Thank you for that. And we see a, a cat here as well. Uh, the inevitable Zoom cat. <laughs> Uh, we hope the information provided and the discussion was relevant and useful in expanding your perspective on global health in the Arctic today. We look forward to hosting the sixth webinar, Effects of Health Policies and Local Interventions on Health Co Outcomes Among the Sami in Norway. So moving from Canada to Norway next time. This will be held on Monday, March the 15th from 10 to 11 Eastern Standard Time once again. It feature, features Lars. Hellender, a psychologist specializing in adult psychiatry, suicidology, and community psychology in northern Norway. And uh, Lars is a Sami himself. Enjoy the rest of the day, everyone. We look forward to your participation in our next exciting webinar. Thank you and merci. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.